Um, all right, I, as I was saying to Mary Lou before we started this, this is one panel I'm not worried about running out of material to talk about. Um, and in fact, I'll probably just sit back and let them talk about the, the wonderful work they did together and the fun that they had. Um, but the big theme I think that runs through all of Linda's work is the strong, wonderful, hilarious, sexy women. Um, and they're all, and, <laughs> you're welcome. And exactly, you have to write what you know, right? Um, and so, but very specifically, the Southern women um, that I guess weren't really being represented on TV, right? Does this work? Yeah. <laughs> um, right, I feel that, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit hoarse. We came by car and cut a bronchial thing on the way, so I apologize for my scratchy throat. Yes, I think that's true. I wanted to show women that I knew in my own life and I never really saw them on TV. I was always feeling like, where's the other half of us? You know, half of the United States is missing. In comedies, we had Dukes of Hazard, and uh, my, later, my name is Earl, and we had Beverly Hillbillies and Hee Haw. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't know anybody who talked like that or acted like that, especially not women. And so that's kind of what started it. Right, right. Um, and I guess you, you sort of er, got recognition first for an episode you wrote of MASH with Mary Kay Place. That's right. Um, which earned her an Emmy nomination very early. Um, that was our first, if I can interrupt, that yeah. was the first script we ever wrote. Well, our mentors were, if, I'm sure you're all TV people because you're here. Um, you know, we were just out of college and our mentors were Larry Galbart, Norman Lear, and, and Jim Brooks. And we weren't even smart enough to know that that was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and everything wonderful just happened to us immediately. We wrote our first episode for Magic was nominated for an Emmy. And then because of Larry Galbart, they were looking for the women of the year in comedy. Certainly shouldn't have been us. But they, it was a big event from Lincoln Center in New York. And they picked all the best women in the country. And we were whisked there to be the women in comedy. And I came out on the stage of that. It was live on television, national television. And they said... Um, and I was standing next to Roberta Peters for opera and Lillian Hellman for literature. <laughs> Just out of college. And I called home that night and I went, Mom, Dad, you said life was hard. It's so easy. <laughs> and oh, that was man. our start. Later, of course, we ran into a lot of brick walls, but it was a fun start. That is, that is a fantastic start. But sort of wisely, it sounds like you weren't interested in working on other people's shows. So you started I wasn't writing around. really. I loved Larry, and he was great to me. I did five uh, scripts, and I did Hollets and Empty Arms. Well, that was Mary Kay's in mine, and then later I did The Nurses, mm -hmm. um, which I loved working with Loretta. Um, yeah, and that just kind of launched us, and then one day I had a, um, a deal with a famous, kind of famous Hollywood actor, and I was sitting in my office, and I just thought, I really don't want to do this, but I knew if I did it, I could probably get on the air. I called a gentleman named Mike Ogans, who um, passed away last week, so I want to mention his name because he's the reason for designing women. And I said, you know, I just want to come over there and tell you that I don't want to do this. And what I really want to do, I want to write about four women, and I want them to be Southern. They're going to have really big mouths. They're going to piss everybody off. And I don't care where they work. And he said, come on over. And I, I went over, and I just I said that. And he said, well, we'll shoot that show. Incredible. And, and it Again, it's easy, just that easy. Another easy <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then later, later, I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, we, we've had a lot of adversity, but yeah, that was part of the good start. Yeah, I think we've actually got a great clip uh, that speaks to the Southern charm from Designing Women. So fantastic. I'll never forget watching the second episode of Designing Women with my family when uh, the night the light went out and Georgia's speech was delivered. And my dad let out this huge yelp and was just like, woo, this is a thing. <laughs> and, and he was ahead of his time. Yeah, yes, thankfully so. Yes. Uh, that, you know, so many things on the internet, and I'll say this quickly, but um, if you Google Designing Women and Dixie Carter, I, I, there's, she told off a conservative radio host, and that's up to 15 million across all venues, now 15 million hits. Um, she tells off Donald Trump. She tells off, everybody she told off on the show. It just plays and plays and plays. Yes, uh, it has but, life. Yeah, we got so lucky life. with that cast because you know that day that Mike Ogan said yes, we'll shoot that show. I would have been nothing had not the casting director Fran Bascom, who just was so brilliant with the plays every night. She put those four women together. I had nothing to do with it, um, and it's just the you know it's just one of those 
chemical things that, right. you know, just real spontaneous, memorable, long-lasting combustion. Yeah, well, we'd actually like to uh, invite two of the cast members from Designing Women to Skype in. Um, so obviously bear with us. Technology is never anyone's friend. Um, but we do, uh, allegedly, we'll soon be having Annie Potts calling in from New Orleans and Gene Smart calling in from Los Angeles. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> Is it me or Jean you've got? We've got you, Annie. You, the, the room uh, is yours. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. But uh, we're all here, and thank you so much for calling in. Hey, thanks for having me. And it looks like we've got, uh, we've almost got Jean. <laughs> Has Annie won anything for calling in? <laughs> yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> uh, well, and let's just, um, why don't I just start with um, Annie now, and if, if we're able to get Jean in, we'll move from there. But uh, Annie, just to bring you up to speed, we were just talking about um, the strong, wonderful, witty, sexy women that inhabit Linda, Linda's world, uh, you being one of them. So um, I'd love to hear what your memory is of being introduced to your character by Linda. Uh, oh gosh. Well, Linda had already written something wonderful and put Jean and me together uh, in, a, in, in another show. And we had played um, uh, sisters who were thieves. <laughs> so, and it was so good and so funny. And uh, Jean and I, um, hit it off immediately and uh, so you know I, I knew that whatever she uh, she wrote was going to be awesome for me I at, at first I thought oh I, I don't I don't want to be the the shop I sing leather um, you know but to, that turned out to be a great fit for me Although I'm not, not really shy. <laughs> <laughs> well, there really wasn't room for anyone to ultimately be shy in the Sugar Baker but, world. But Fran did put them together in that show also. Then she suggested them for the new show. Um, she and Jean were in Cope. They were, I believe they were in Cope. Were you in Copenhagen or somewhere in Europe? We, we filmed that in Europe and they were in jail together. And they were just, <laughs> they were just funny as hell. But, but, you know, Annie came on. I think Annie had the uh, really most challenging part in designing women because she had to be the most relatable every woman and still be incredibly funny. And, you know, she just, um, she just left. I mean, no joke. And I don't like to write jokes, but no speech, no whatever she got, you know, it was never left on the floor. I mean, she could take, you know, I remember in the pilot, she was talking about why her husband wasn't interested in her, in her anymore. Mm -hmm. And he was a gynecologist, and there was only so much you can do with, you know, down there. <laughs> and talked about bows and waxing and all of this stuff. And she just made it. I mean, I remember every five words, people were laughing, every sentence, you know. I mean, it, it, she just milked it, and I saw a laugh that I hadn't even intended. But Annie always gives you that. Right, right. We were we were forerunners of the down there talk. Yes, I'm sure Mary Lou and Kim can also speak to experience with that. Thanks to Linda's words and writing. Well, uh, the whole thing about Eve and she was that she wanted to see a sexy couple on television, and that was so important. And the thing was that the first season, the first uh, episode was about a failed vasectomy. He had had a failed vasectomy. We already had three kids, and now I'm pregnant with the fourth. But she wrote a character. My character was madly in love with him as a young teenager. We got married when I was 18. We had a baby right away. And now I was like a lawyer. I was this very powerful woman in the town, the daughter of the newspaper uh, editor, uh, the owner of the newspaper played by Hal Holbrook. And she wrote this incredible woman that was so strong and was a mother and was a sexy wife and was like a good had a good relationship because we were a family on evening shade we had not only tony winners and academy award winners we had 
babies, children, older people. I mean, the age range was incredible, and we were like a real family. Wouldn't you say that? Yeah, we tried to do with that show exactly yeah. what we were trying to do with. That was the domestic side of designing women. You know, designing women were the really sophisticated Atlanta, uh, unapologetic, mouthy women. And Evening Shade was kind of like our answer to Mayberry, which I had loved, but they weren't the smartest people. And, and Mayberry, I, to be clear, not Evening Shade. <laughs> I love them to this day, but you know, I wanted to show the people in my town. Uh, my dad, I grew up, my dad was a lawyer, my three uncles were a lawyer, my grandfather, they were always standing on the furniture, you know, arguing about literature and politics and everything. I wanted to show that. And so, um, you know, Mary Lou came in, and the other thing we wanted to show was the romance thing, which we did, I think, pretty well on Designing Women. Yeah. Um, Jean met her husband and fell in love with Richard. He was Annie's boyfriend on Designing Women. Delta married Mac. Dixie, Dixie and Hal were newly married. Harry and I were newly married. So the romance thing was really important to me. I was so tired of sitcom women in their house coats saying, more coffee, honey, you know, and they're all, they're all neutered people. And I just wanted to see, you know, I, I, I hate the word sitcom. I just thought of it as a little play, you know, and we want to show. And also, I think in the South, the male-female thing is it really runs strong. You know, I think women are more like girlfriends than wives in general. And it's just kind of often a sexier thing, and it lasts a whole life, I think, if, if you're lucky. And Mary Lou personified that. I remember when you came in and read for that and you left the room, I mean, we almost had to, you know, sedate Bert. <laughs> he, was just, <laughs> he was ecstatic. But he called me in. I don't know if you remember. The June 22nd, uh, 1990. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't heard, she's got a phenomenal memory. But, but anyway, so yeah. he had me come in, and the guy, the other, everybody else was already cast, Charlie Durning and, and Hal Holbrook and all these other people. And I came in, and that was actually the fifth time I'd worked with Bert, so I was really excited to be I working with that. him again. And so when he had me come in and everything else, and, and I remember it, it, was, it was just a wonderful experience. Every day was like a master class because everybody had very different ways of working. And Linda's dialogue is so rich and so textured and so much fun to wrap your mouth around that everybody had their own way of doing it. Sometimes, you know, some of the, some of the people had it like day one. Some people had to like bump her around a bit. Uh, some people had to write it on the set, you know. <laughs> so, some people had to have a thing in there. Anyway, it was like this incredible, <laughs> incredible family of a group of people and everybody's different methods were respected because of her writing. Well, it was like that the first year. And Bert had a kind of a different idea about the show. I mean, that's the direction I wanted to go. Bert, I think, still had a lot of Smokey and the Bandit in his head. And right. so we didn't always agree on, you know, which way the show could go. And, I, and uh, the first year, I'm extremely proud of. It was the best new show of the season across the board, from the LA Times to the New York Times. But um, after that, I think that it still had some great um, episodes, but it kind of went a rockier way for me. Mm -hmm. meaning the Smokey and the Bandit way. But the one thread that runs through this, <laughs> from the designing women, through Evening Shade, through eventually Hearts of Fire, though it was an essentially Southern show, it was Southern in tone, to, you're going to know why Kim's here soon, uh, 12 Miles of Bad Road is the unseen show that we did. And, and Kim just, you know, is from Alabama, and she, uh, they're both, you know, a couple of the greatest actresses I know, but I know you've seen Kim's work in Gone Girl and... Fear the Walking Dead. Yeah. Fear of the Walking Dead, Deadwood. Um, and she also, you know, we carried the same theme in 12 Miles, which we'll talk about, but right. it's a Texas show. It's a billionaire Texas family with Lily Tomlin, Mary Kay Place, Kim Dickens, a lot of Leslie yes. Jordan. Yeah, I hope someday you'll get to it see it. Really but anyway, good. This, this, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to tease that up because I like to say yeah, it's the imagine. yet to be seen show. And it's not yeah. a show that we will never see because in true ATX spirit, we are here to make things happen. And. <laughs> Thank you. And it was Linda Bloodworth Thompson on HBO. So Yes. Yes, we were unleashed. So we're, we're all we having sex things. everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't participate in I was uh, I play um, Jonelle, in, who is a Christian evangelical, working on her sex life, <laughs> working on her the monogamy thing with the marriage. And uh, so she was practicing tantric sex with her husband, played by Gary Cole, and taking pole dancing lessons. I got and I think we were very prescient because we had a lot of discussions on the show about her being an evangelical, and we wanted to show, um, you know, that Hollywood makes fun of evangelicals routinely without really getting to know them. 
and what their hearts are, and, and, and they're not all stupid, bigoted people. And so, you know, we wanted to show that, and I think it was sort of uh, a little bit prescient of what's going on today, you know, and we forget the flyover people, and we sort of recognize, even though the, the, our family were billionaires, we had a lot of uh, flyover people coming in and out of the show. But the one theme that comes through that unifies us all, the thing that Annie and Jean and Delta and Dixie started, and then Mary Lou kept going on Evening Shade and ending with Kim, um, up to date for us. Um, it's, it's this theme about being Southern. And when I started in Hollywood, I just didn't see any Southern programming. I didn't meet any Southern people at the networks. One of the things HBO said to me is, how do you get to um, Texas? You know, and the guy meeting with me was wearing a little Western shirt for every meeting. And I go, you don't have to do that. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> a little heavy I'm not on the a theme. cowgirl. So anyway, it's like being from Ethiopia. You know, they don't, and, and they totally mischaracterize the South. And, right. you know, and I, I just, I grew up being so proud of where I was from. Um, and I wanted people to see some blue dots in the South, too. Besides right. a nice evangelical, we wanted to see all the blue dots, for example, that live in Austin and all the, the clear-thinking evangelicals. We want them to be seen, and they are almost never seen on TV. And believe me, eventually that causes a big car wreck in our culture mm -hmm. because you fear what you don't know or you hate what you don't know. So it is very important. And we've seen how people like Norman Lear and Jim Brooks have, have changed the landscape of television by taking on all of the other issues like sexism and racism and misogyny. And now we have regionalism. And I think mm -hmm. we're the only people riding that horse. So it's just so good that you came today because I feel like you support that if you're here. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'd like to, if I could, to that point, um, ask each of the actors here if they could talk about a particular scene that Linda wrote for them that they were sort of proudest of, or proudest to be a part of, to be that person, that character, if you have a moment that you could think of. Um, Annie, if I could start with you. <laughs> uh, so I mean, you know, we were the 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 A show was quite historic. I had a wonderful monologue about condoms, I think. Or was that an, another episode? The condoms separate. Anyway. <laughs> I think 160 some odd. And the first year we didn't yeah. even have a, we, we, we never had a writing staff. I had to write the first 50 scripts. And these brilliant oh actresses, wow. my mother was dying of AIDS. I found that out the day the show got a pickup. We never oh. had, we were never one script ahead. We couldn't be, I couldn't find any Southern writers. The first 50 shows, these ladies, I wrote it on Saturday. It was picked up on Sunday. On Monday, they put it on its feet. And no, it, 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 I, I want to say that it's a little bit braggy, but I'm just so proud of all of it because I, it's never been done. And we still don't even know how we did it, but they did it. I mean, you know, they learned the lines. They, they, had, they did all the changes. I, you know, they would see me coming. I don't know why they didn't pull out a gun and shoot me. Right. <laughs> like, here's <laughs> more changes. Get out there and be funny. I'm sure they wanted to kill me. But anyway, you know, they just, and we were just, and it was exhilarating too because CBS um, and a man named Jeff Sagansky, who's the other reason that we had such a great show, and Howard Stringer um, also, uh, the chairman, who became chairman of Sony. But anyway, they just said, fly. I mean, you want to do Clarence Thomas? Are you mad about Clarence Thomas? Do Clarence Thomas, talk about him. You know, whatever was on our minds. Right. Um, and so it was exhilarating. But Annie's, um, I'm, she probably won't like this because it's such a, um, an easy one. But I still love Big Hoss and Little Falsy. I still love Annie when she got her padded, bra I mean, when she got her implants and tried them out. <laughs> and she felt so cocky and she kept saying she felt like she could get into a fist fight. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think only Annie could have pulled that off. I think it would have sounded so weird, but she just, uh, you know, somehow made it hilarious. Um, and that, yeah, I remember that that came out. I'd been doing a film up in Canada, and I had uh, I had used padded for the character, 
And I noticed that everybody had a, a different relationship with me because of them. <laughs> and I came back when we started up the, the season again. I, I told Linda about that. And she took that bone and ran with it, which was a, a lot of fun. Um, and yes, I, I, I saw people come up to me in the airport and go, I just love your show about them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Mary Lou, uh, Linda alluded a bit to the fact that sometimes scripts came in a little bit later than you might have been accustomed to <laughs> on other shows. Um, can you just talk about a little bit what that's, that was like? I mean, I imagine it had to be very exciting. Uh, well, I don't think we ever worked on a Monday because, you know, the <laughs> script was usually... So somebody made the joke, I don't know if this was true or not, but they said, Linda usually starts at, at the tick, tick, tick end of 60 Minutes. And that's, that's when she started. Well, that means the messenger's coming. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so we usually didn't work, but, but you'd get it, and it was so rich and so fabulous. I had a, a teacher in uh, high school, a senior uh, English teacher, who once said to us, I want your paper so concise and so rich and so full of everything that you've researched that if I threw water on it, it would expand to 10 times its size. And Linda's scripts were so rich and so textured, it's like it was all there, and we just could ride with it. And it was really something. And unlike Designing Women, which had four main characters and a few other people, we had a cast of a lot of people. I mean, we had not only the main family, et cetera, but we also had all the different people that were connected to the town, including the stripper, who uh, Fontana Bosley, who was in a, a minor character the first episode and then ended up marrying Hal Holbrook's character later on. But she, too, talked about wearing, like, as soon as she put those breast, uh, breasts on, uh, the crew treated her differently. And they had just seen her go into wardrobe and then out again. So I, I, might, I totally know what Annie's talking about. But it was so amazing to get the, these, these scripts that were, you just had no idea how one person could write all of this material. And so you knew that all these characters lived within Linda and that she knew them and they were so familiar to her and became so familiar to us as, you know, as actors. It was great. It, was really well, it helped to have Mary Lou from, straight from Taxi fame. Oh. Uh, we also had Charles Durning and Michael Jeter who just <laughs> won the Emmy on Broadway but and yeah. uh, Ossie Davis who stood on the stage with Martin Luther King when he gave the I Have a Dream speech. I mean, our, uh, Ruby D. Uh, our cast, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Ashley, Elizabeth Ashley, 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 Ann Wedgworth, Ann Wedgworth, all from Broadway. I Bob mean, Hobart, it yeah. was it was an embarrassment of riches, and and really, Bert brought that cast with him. Yeah, and 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 she fed all the you know she had a lot of mouths to feed, and they were all fed. We were all fed. And I heard well fed on all your sets. It wasn't <laughs> just jet. There was like the designing women and the evening shade. Craft we services had, were we had barbecue. <laughs> yeah, we flew in barbecue because we miss what you all take for granted. <laughs> <laughs> and we also had uh, as our warm-up band because maybe people don't know this, but on a sitcom night because you're shooting, you know, and so you've got the audience and somebody somebody has to be entertaining people. Not only did we have a comedian, which was many times uh, Roy Combs, uh, Ray Combs from uh, uh, you know Family Feud and stuff, but also um, uh, Roger Clinton was our warm-up band, was there every Amazing. Friday. And we, I first met Bill Clinton because she brought him on the set. He was a governor. This beautiful man turns around and you go, oh, he takes your breath away. And of course, he ended up being president. So right. he, <laughs> he actually announced on our stage that he was running for president. And the audience laughed that the governor of Arkansas was going to be president. <laughs> they, didn't know, they didn't understand who he was. And I said, no, no, he really is, you know. Mm. Um, and so he was, uh, Hillary actually named the show Evening Shade. Um, and so they kept close ties with it all the way through. And they loved what we were doing, just like when I did The Man from Hope for him in 92. It coincided with the show, you know, because, again, we wanted to show in The Man from Hope that that's where all the good things about him came from, you know, that small town. And he loved, you know, the Evening Shade, when it, especially when it began and what it stood for. I think we actually, do. we, we have a clip of Evening Shade ready to show. Do you remember the speech that you wrote for Bert? I don't think I wrote that. I think that oh. might have been uh, Michael and David. Yeah. No, because, they, because he tells me the whole story. I'm so nervous the first time I'm up there. And then he tells me the story about Kennedy and Nixon and stuff. Oh. And I was like brought in. Yeah. yeah. Well, we still, that's a joke still in that cowboy joke. That's why I don't think I wrote it. Oh, the second season. Uh, okay. <laughs> I was gone. <laughs> oh. 
but next door. We were right next door. We went yeah. on, that's when we went on to Hearts of Fire. I was going to say, and yes. I'm so sorry, so Marky's not here. Marky Post, one of my dearest friends, and wanted to be here so much today, and she got a call back on something, show that was really important, and, you know, she was very upset. Yeah. But, but she and uh, Billy Bob Thornton and John Ritter, even though the show wasn't really in the South, they, they rode the same vibe, the same writing vibe. And again, I think it's, I think it's the most underrated show that we've done. And Billy Bob and John were so brilliant together. They became the greatest of friends when John died. Um, well, Billy Bob named his son after my husband, Harry Thomas. And, and, and when John died, Billy Bob and Harry both gave the eulogy. Neither of them could get through it. But uh, Billy Bob got his start on Evening Shade. He had one line, and he came up and had some flowers for it. Ava. The, no, that one, was but it? also we, no, he played Bert's cousin. He says, okay. I'm a bad time, uh, Luanda. I'm getting, you know, I'm going to jail. And he so when, he started, it. when he started, he just had like one, one line. He said, these, I brought some flowers, Wood. And everybody went, who's that guy? Seriously, everybody went, who's that guy? He had one line. Yeah. So uh, he lived in his dressing room, had no money, lived on potatoes, had a heart attack. He was writing this little screenplay. I, I hope he won't care if I tell this. He'll probably never know if you all don't tell him. Um, <laughs> and he said, you know, I've never asked anybody for money in my life. But I just need a little bit of an advance, um, you know, because I'm out of money and I'm writing this screenplay. We said you can live in the dressing room, and he did. Um, wow. And, of course, we gave him the money. And, I mean, the first paycheck he got, he was back in. Money was on the desk. You know, that almost never happens. And... Um, the screenplay he was writing was a little thing called Sling Blade. Right. Yeah. And then he got the Oscar. Yeah. So right. he had a straight up trig better than even the the Lincoln Center story. I was gonna, I was gonna say. <laughs> he was straight up. Yeah. But anyway, that was um, you know the Hearts of Fire thing. Again, I guess. Well, I don't know if Beth is here. Is Beth here at all? Beth Broderick. She was trying to come. She was part of it. Yeah. But uh, it was going on right next door to Evening Shade, and so we were kind of companion shows going back and forth. And you were also super busy at the time with the, camp with the Clinton campaign, with right? With the Clinton campaign, and that's what I was going to say. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. So then uh, Hillary's dad, Hugh Rodham, was on the show, and it was kind of political, and that's where a writer can get fouled up because I had you know, been heavily involved in the campaign and in the convention, and my husband and I were kind of the chairman of the inauguration, so we were doing a lot of stuff. And um, uh, there, were, there were a lot of, you know, angry people didn't like our friends. And so we were involved in that. All of a sudden, I had great reviews my whole life with my writing. And all of a sudden, Frank Rich and Maureen Dowd were calling me the sitcom tycoon queen from Dogpatch. Right. Yeah, well, again, regionalism. Um, but, so I started fighting back on Hearts of Fire, you know, and telling people off like Jacob Weisberg. And everybody was going, who's Jacob Weisberg? <laughs> so you have to be careful, you know. And really not get not let personal things get to you. I learned a good lesson on that. And I, but um, the show, I think, yeah, we perhaps we got a little too steeped in politics, but um, anyway, it's it stands on its own. Absolutely. If you if you go back and see it, it's hard to find. But I think John and Marky and Billy Bob created their own little world, little magical world there. And Beth Broderick was part of it, and she's from Austin. I was going to recognize her, but I don't think Beth is here. Um, no, we do actually have um, a, 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 a greeting from Marky, actually, um, that she recorded when she found out she couldn't be here um, that. that we can queue up. Hi, Linda, and hi to the ATX audience. I'm so glad that you're here to celebrate, Linda. I wish I was there. Up until two days ago, I was going to be on a plane yesterday coming to Austin, a city that I love and I've worked in, and I am just so sorry that the exigencies of show business have kept me here. But I wanted to be sure that I had an opportunity to tell you a little bit about the woman that you're celebrating here, Linda Bloodworth, who is one of my favorite people in the world. I've always said that um, I can't believe I have a friend that is as talented as Linda. It's like, you know, being friends with Harper Lee or Adele or something. You know what I mean? There, there's just very few people that have the talent, the wit, the brains, the heart, the sweetness. The saltiness of Linda Bloodworth, and um, it was my honor to work with her and to be friends with her 
for the longest time. Linda, I'm sitting on a chair that you and Harry gave us, one of four rocking chairs after we built our house, and I'm on the veranda of our house in Toluca Lake, and I just thought it was fitting that I'd be sitting here. I did want to say that as an actor, the most important thing that we have are the words that we're given to say. And when I was doing Hearts of Fire, one of my favorite characters I've ever played in my life, and continues to be, with John Ritter, who we all love and loved. Um, we used to sometimes get our scripts like the day before we were going to be shooting. <laughs> I'm just saying. A recurring Linda, theme. Because Linda wrote every script. <laughs> Linda was Linda was a one-man band, and she uh, would write the scripts, and Harry would direct the shows. And it was a pleasure, but sometimes we'd be sort of sitting on the stage waiting for words to come. And as John used to say, what would happen was maybe 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, these gems would fall from heaven and we would be able to say them and they were just, it was just so wonderful to be able to say your words, to be inside your head. And sometimes I would ask you, Linda, what were you thinking when you said this? So you can tell me how to say it. I want to do it justice. It was the time of my life. And in our background, we also have the man who's shooting this right now is my husband, Michael, who you know, you gave your start to, who is a writer, has been writing for 20 years. 20? 25. 25 years <laughs> because of you and Harry, because you gave him his first script and because he wrote on Evening Shade and he wishes he could be there too, but he's got a job, so he can't be there. But um, So Michael, I want you to turn the camera around just to say hi. <laughs> See, I didn't do know you were going to do that. Okay. Uh, hi, Linda. Uh, whoever's seeing this, to whatever degree I have wit and some soul to whatever I write. It's because it came through osmosis from Linda at the very beginning. She kind of forged whatever my storytelling abilities are by my being around her and seeing how she writes. I actually, as an actor, before I was a writer, got a chance to act on Designing Women, which was great fun, playing Galen King. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Linda, I love you. Uh, you've given such a wealth of amazing television uh, to the world, really. And uh, you were first yeah, exactly. with humor to address AIDS. You were the first in so many ways to discover and illuminate so many social issues, always with humor and insight. So anyway, I love you. I wish I could be there with you and Harry, too. And I thank you for my start. Okay, okay. back to Mark. Over to me. Yeah. <laughs> back to Mark. Anyway. <laughs> You're, you and Harry mean so much to us, and we just love you, and I love you, and you know I do, and I would have been there on, if, I would have been there for anything other than this incredible network test deal that I have on Monday, and I'm so sorry, but I'm kind of happy about the thing, but you know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, anyway, let me get back to you. I love you. I love your soul for writing. I love your soul. I love your southern soul. I love the way you see both sides of it. I love you for giving me the phrase man-loving feminist because I am that and I know you are too. So Linda, congratulations. We love you. All right. This is not, guys, this is a celebration of the show that I know. Mark is just, I mean, she's the sweetest. I give her both my kidneys. <laughs> that, was, that was adorable, but it's really not a celebration of me. It really is a celebration of all these, you know, incredible actors, and we've been so incredibly lucky to have these shows. I was kind of faltering on um, on uh, Hearts of Fire because I was trying to remember something I wanted to say, and I can't tell the whole story, but I did want you to know that we were so ambitious on that show. Again, we were, you know, we had it half in Washington, half in a small town, too complicated to go into, but we decided that we could change Rush Limbaugh and we could bring him to our way of thinking. <laughs> There's a lot Mainly I decided this. And so we invited him to come out and he was on the show for a week. He fell in love with Marky. And, and Roger Ailes came with him. Wow. Who also fell in love with Marky. And um, <laughs> he stayed a week and we did everything we could to befriend him and win him over. I mean, when he left on Friday night, he and Roger Ailes were in a limo with the, 
with the sunroof and he'd won a Santa Claus in a game we were playing, a big blow up Santa Claus and it was out the window and out the top. Uh. And he, he rode the window down and he said, this has been the greatest week of my life. <laughs> I don't think he ever went to the prom or anything. <laughs> <laughs> so we did everything we could and we did not win him over, but, but we tried. But that show was um, one of the most fun experiences ever. And that was very, very sweet. And Michael Ross, by the way, was a great writer on Evening Shade, and he wrote some wonderful things for Mary Lou and everybody else. Um, if we could, though, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, 12 Miles of Bad Road, um, which, is, as she mentioned before, is a, is a series that they filmed 10 episodes of? Or we seven? filmed five episodes. It's the most expensive series. Well, we were on the sixth. It was the most. Ex it is to this day the most expensive comedy ever filmed. Twenty-eight million dollars. Um, I called HBO one day, just like on Designing Women, and that's kind of a lesson for for young writers. You know, just what have you got to lose? Um, they saw me as a network writer, and I called and said, "Well, I have an idea. I want to come over there." And Carolyn Strauss, the president of HBO, said, "Linda, the eye of the needle here is very small. I don't think you're going to be crawling through it." So that, being Southern, made me so angry. I got a little yes. nervous tick in my eye. <laughs> <laughs> my husband said, oh, honey, you're not going to be able to let this go. <laughs> I mean, I went in my room, and I wrote this treatment. It was 28 pages. I wrote it in a... I mean, I just couldn't stop writing. I was so... Well, no other word. I don't like this word, but I was pissed. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, I, and I sent it to her. And she, to her credit, she called me. She's... She's a very, very tough lady. Larry Galbart used to tell me she had a big red no on her desk made out of wood. It was painted red and it faced you. <laughs> Unbelievable. Larry Galbart said, how did you get past that no? He said, I can't even pitch to her. How did you get past it? And I said, I never saw it. <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh, you're such a little cheerleader. <laughs> um, she's, she called me and said, come over. I did. She said, we like this. I said, okay. So, you know, let's get started. So what it turned into, over a year and a half, they take forever. They started out, you know, a, like a, the car dealership in a small town, and the country club look like, looks like a 7-Eleven. I know you know these, these towns. But mm -hmm. Chris Albrecht, the president of HBO, wanted to make it bigger than that. So he said, make them billionaires. Let's go for it. Let's spend all the money. And we did. $28 million. We cast it. Kim came in. Um, we had Lily Tomlin, Mary Kay Place, Leslie Jordan. It was a huge cast. It was so, never has so much gone so right, except for these other shows. But it, everything went right. And, and we were ready. Yeah, it was an hour comedy drama, which was kind of unheard of. And Kim, uh, Kim was a standout. Eliza Coop, I don't know if you know her. Yeah. She, Catherine Lanasa was married to Dennis Hopper. Oh, my God, she was such a pistol in it. Um, Anyway, make a long story short, we're scheduled to go on. We have an air date. The trailers have, run, have been on the air. We're premiering with the show. Um, was it Hamilton or was it, remember that what Paul Giamatti was in it? Um, John no, John Adams. Adams. John, Adams. Yeah. John Adams. We're going to premiere on that night. And the head of HBO got involved in a little brouhaha with his girlfriend, got arrested. The, uh, regime change. Um, New guys came in, and they said, where is Texas? What is this? We don't understand these people. We don't even get what they're talking about. And what is this hook em horns shit? Yeah. <laughs> so that was the end of it. They have it in their basement, and Ron White was in it, and Ron White was coming today, but we told him not to because it was a girl fest. <laughs> um, well, thanks for letting me come. Yeah, <laughs> except for Dear Bill. And he was mad. He said, I insist on coming. Because he's been so mad about the show, he wanted to talk about HBO, but it's probably better he didn't come. <laughs> but anyway, maybe someday we'll see it. Do we have a clip? Yeah, I was going to say, okay. we can see I'll a little bit up. of that world right. um, if you want to call up the clip right now. I hope it's cut. <laughs> there was more. I think they had to cut it. Anyway, it, it broke our hearts, and we oh. still hope someday to go back and get it. And, you know, even though Mary Lou and Annie and all, all the other uh, who have you know, already helped us out so brilliantly. I wanted to go back and get everybody who's ever been on our shows and have them show up, you know, <laughs> in 12 months. Protest, so so yeah. maybe that'll happen someday. By the Aww. way, can I just introduce my husband real fast? He's, yes. he's directed all, all of the most important shows I've ever done, and he's just um, a lovely person. <laughs> 
a lovely man who drove me here. Is he here? I mean, I know Harry. he's in the Where area. Is there he is. There he is. <laughs> Elvis is in the building. <laughs> he's in the building. That's, that's my husband, Harry Thomason. Oh, and Beth, who's that? Oh, Mike, it's Michael. Oh, and Michael. I didn't know Michael was sitting. That's Mary Lou's handsome husband. Yeah. Mary Lou just came from the dedication of... Um, oh, I, I was at the um, SS Gabriel Giffords dedica the, uh, the dedication, the uh, commissioning of the SS Gabriel Giffords. You know, it's a big battleship and it was beautiful. And Hillary Clinton gave the speech, and you know, Gabby Giffords and Mark Kelly were there, and Nancy Pelosi and a bunch of other people. So it was great. Joe Biden, Jill Biden, who's you know part of the whole team. So it, it was beautiful. It was great. And actually, the week uh, evening shade, I got the job of evening shade, and immediately went to Rome to get married to my. My second husband was pregnant with my first child the fourth season of Evening Shade, but Michael's my third and final husband. <laughs> <laughs> so. Didn't you meet him at your class reunion? <laughs> no, he was my college roommate's boyfriend, uh, but the girlfriend code, you know, should be okay after 30 years, so. Right. <laughs> but we reconnected 14 years ago, so. But Fantastic. And reconnected. And reconnected. <laughs> Well, I got all that juice from Evening Shade, you know. Right. <laughs> but you know what else Linda did that was so great? We had a score to that show so many times. You would bring in, like, music and, and whatever you guys had to pay for it. It was amazing. But I remember there's that one thing where, uh, where uh, Taylor, uh, uh, our son Taylor, um, the J.R. Ferguson character, uh, was singing, you know, that, yeah, I'm gonna bring you down, you know, that song. Yeah. And you loved that song. So all of a sudden it became part of the show. That was definitely first year. We yeah. spent a lot of money on music. We were very we spoiled because the president of CBS liked music, too. Yeah. He always had these big ballads. You know, everybody made fun of him. Now he has those in his iPhone. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yes, we spent a lot on, on music, but I think, again, it was part of our southernness. Um, the thing is, I think the takeaway from today probably is, and I've already said it, but we're going to keep rolling, you know, with this theme because it's so important. And as our culture becomes more divided, I mean, I'm not a sociologist and I'm not a historian. I'm not really, you know, um, qualified to talk about this. But I think that television in my life has changed every social issue I cared about. You know, how women are treated and perceived in the workplace, uh, reproductive rights, um, race, you know. I mean, when I was a little kid, my dad took me to the uh, Hillcrest swimming pool, and you know, we're in this little town where um, we're southern. And my dad said, You see that? It was Tuesday. He said, You see that, Nelson? That was my nickname. And he said, That's that's color day, and it was all black swimming in the pool on Tuesday. And he said, Just so you know, that's wrong, you know. And that was a lot. It doesn't sound like a lot. We didn't march, and we weren't heroes, but that was a lot to know in this little town. Well, my grandfather was a hero, he got shot because he represented black people. But um, the point is, all of those men in that southern town, they all got, uh, you know, snip, snip, and became ovarian. <laughs> they became women on my shows. They became characters. All the men in my life in those southern towns became all the women. <laughs> yes, I, what do you call that? It's not emasculated. What do you call it when you snip, snip? <laughs> I'm not sure, but you get the picture. Um, yeah, so they contributed so much to this, and that's the ball that I want to keep rolling. You know, the smart Southerners, the, uh, the people you didn't expect to be at the party, um, and I think it's so important now because we're more divided than ever, and we view people as the other more than ever. And so I think television is the great healer in this divide that we're experiencing right now, and the more... I want more Southern writers. I want more Southern actors. And we want to, you know, make a mark on people's minds that, you know, we are closer than you think. We are more relatable than you think. And there's not this big line across the United States that, that divides us. You know, we're, we're all diverse people and, and, and don't just stereotype us. So that's the theme of my writing life and everything we've tried to do. So... You know, hopefully we'll be able to continue that. I do want to say I have a new show called Strange Peaches. It's about four women in an Austin bookstore. Um, and Great. I was inspired by Governor Ann Richards and Molly Ivins. Wow. Um, 
And one of the characters is kind of channeling Molly Ivins. Uh, and right. it's for a, a major, you know, cable supplier. I won't say who because we're not picked up yet. But um, it, it looks good, and we hope so. And maybe we'll be back for that. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I will say, and I think I speak for everyone here, that uh, it, it is false to say that you are not a hero. You are, in fact, a hero uh, as an artist so. for being committed to writing about the things that are important to you and trying to make change through TV. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. If, if, if you have to drag people kicking and screaming to social issues, you might as well like make them laugh their asses off, which is what she yeah. always does. You know. That's the best way to do it. Yeah, that's right. And I think we've got about five minutes left for audience questions. Um, so if you can raise your hands with any questions. Um, I think we have someone monitoring that. Because we can keep talking, but I did promise. I did promise at the top. Um, You're that hungry. Some questions. It's, it's always like karaoke. Nobody wants to be the first, and then you can't get exactly. the you know microphone away. From Thank you for being brave. Yes, uh, you. Um, I just had a question about which veteran characters you see on TV that you like right now, or which shows. Um, I guess you know, I don't really. I mean, there's been some good dramas, but even when Kira Sedgwick does the closer and she's Southern, you really. It's not, it doesn't have the southern thing for me. You know, she, I, I just know she's in that town. But I don't see the southernness in it, you know, which I think is so important. And also, you know, just, I mean, we're really just northerners in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm proud of that. You know, and, I, and my husband and I always marvel, you know, like, our, we have the best food in the world. And, you know, we bow to New York. Uh, we don't bow to New York or anyone else. We got all the barbecue and the comfortable chairs, the Barca lounger. How stupid can we be? <laughs> <laughs> but, but really, you know, we, the lifestyle in the South, the, I mean, since we drove here and as we got closer and closer to Texas, people got nicer and nicer, you know? In New Mexico, it was like, you know, don't let... I mean, they were fine, but it was just like nobody's helping you or saying, you know, have a good day or where are you from, anything. And as we get to Texas, it's like everybody is so helpful and so kind. And I just think there's a, there's a lifestyle and there's a, you know, there's an aura to the South and there's a, um, an atmosphere that you, you don't get anywhere else. I think that's why the rest of the world is so fascinated with us. So why, your question, what shows do you like? I don't really know any, any shows much in comedy, do you? Good behavior. Yeah. Yeah. It's shocking. I've even had my agents in Hollywood tell me they would not. I have a scholarship company. By the way, can I just say real fast while Annie's here too, Annie Potts and Jean Smart and Dixie and Delta and I, we have put 167 women through college with Designing Women wow. Money. Wow. Mm -hmm. so, all Southern, all Southern, all Southern women. Um, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't see that show, but that makes me happy. But yeah, my agents have said they would not come to my town because it was in the Ozarks and they were afraid to come there. Wow. They're not my agents anymore. I was going to say, I, I believe you mean former agent, yeah. yes. Um, is there anybody else? Yes. Yes. Is that Mark? <laughs> How are you? Are you filing a lawsuit? <laughs> <laughs> You're Burt Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best answer. Thank you, Mary Lou. <laughs> I have no idea. We were always mentioning people's names because it was, it's, it's kind of silly, but it was fun. And they really liked it. And I made a mistake once. There was a woman in my husband's hometown named Erna Wallingsford, Wallingsford. And the joke was that she was so large getting married. It was an inappropriate joke, but she looked like a bride float. It wasn't really funny. Somehow it stayed in the show. And I forgot to change the name. Oh. Uh, oh. 
And so it came out as Erna Wallingsford, uh, you know, was so big at her wedding. She looked like a bride float. Uh, I was so appalled. And I, I mean, I don't know how I didn't notice it until it was already about to air. And I had to call her. She was thrilled. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was the greatest thing that ever happened to her. I didn't worry after that. Uh, but thank you, Mark. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of people have given me a lot of great stuff, including you. <laughs> um, well, uh, I want to thank everyone for being here. Thank Annie, thank you for Skyping in. Thank you. Um, and we have. Thank you, Annie. We have one um, fun clip to say goodbye with that I think will feel especially timely now. But again, thank you all for coming, and thank, thank you to you all for being here.